Another Sunday, another case of the scaries to start your work week. Welcome to the newest edition of the Sunday Scaries, where we have all your gore, lore, and more, covering all the latest horror happenings, slicing open all the latest horror news, and dissecting it bit by bit, finding all those juicy innards. Pour that cup of coffee and turn right while we do on a tour of terror. And we're fresh off our uh, little foray at the theater of uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. And uh, I would say overall, if you checked out our review on the channel, we were pretty positive for the most part. I, I mean, we went in with maybe a little lower bar set for this one. Uh, but, you know, a lot of controversy still stirring about this one. I did check out a couple of reviews. I think maybe people who are not really too deep in uh, the horror community. And uh, as expected, I'm too happy. Yeah, no, that's kind of the consensus around town. Even people who uh, review horror, there have been some, uh, you know, some who've been kind of like us where it's like, OK, I kind of know what I'm expecting at this point. And then uh, other people who were just like, oh, I, I hate this. Like, why do we need these kind of horror movies, you know, kind of thing? It's just like, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's going to work for some people. It's not going to work for others. Uh, it's just uh, the way everything kind of rolls. And, uh, you know, fortunately for us. Um, you know, I would say that there was some good moments, uh, overall, it's not a, uh, knock it out of the park. Fantastic. Uh, you know, you must go see this movie kind of film, but you know, it had fun moments. Uh, I think, you know, if they really, uh, you know, fix up a couple things and really bump up a few things that they had did right in this one, in the sequel, I think that the sequel could be a lot more fun. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, ultimately, if it stays on this path, uh, then yeah, it would quickly turn into something where it's just like, okay, yeah, it's just kind of pointless at that point. Yeah, I mean, and I think you kind of summed it up the best there in the review where you're like, it's not really a thought-provoking film. It's just something where you go into, you know what to expect. You look at the movie poster, you see Winnie the Pooh, um, and that's what you're going to get. It's it's face mm -hmm. value stuff. It's just meant to be, you know, a, a fun ride, depending on, you know, um, for me, it was only so much fun, but, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a bad flow experience. But, you know, it's like one of those things. That's the beauty of the horror genre. You get your skin and rinks, then you get your Winnie the Poohs, and then you get your killer doll film. So, I mean, it's just kind of like uh, a mixed bag. That's the beauty of the horror genre. We get so many different things. Um, and there's so many different lenses you can kind of view this genre through um, that it's really hard to kind of get that, you know, specific vision of like oh well this is a bad horror movie some work for some people some don't and i mean like now now we're in this whole um kind of uh society of reappraisal where it's like you know who knows what winnie the pooh blood and honey is going to look like in in 20 years yeah with uh you know a lengthy uh filmography behind it and everything like we'll see with uh more installments as the uh, series continues maybe people look at it uh, kind of like how, you know, Terrifier, you were either in that camp or you weren't. But after uh, Terrifier 2, a lot of people who, you know, even us included, who weren't big on that first film, kind of respect it a little bit more. We're kind of like, okay, I get it. It's the groundwork. It lays the formula. And, uh, yeah, it's worth watching every once in a while. So, could happen. Could happen. But, uh, yeah, I guess we should hop right into the news because we got a couple of good stories here, a couple of fun ones. Starting off with uh, something that we kind of mentioned uh, in our review of this film early this year, the first film I think we reviewed of 2023, mm -hmm. Megan, unrated version, coming to digital later this month and a Blu-ray in March. Yeah, I think we pretty much saw this coming. I, I don't think this was much of a surprise to us. It was kind of up in the air whether they were going to do it or not. But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, knowing what we know about this film, this isn't really a shock to me. Yeah, um, I, like you said, uh, I think we kind of pretty much expected this. It was just kind of uh, when we were going to get it. Who knew if this was going to be like a quick release or not? I mean, we're you know, we're still sitting here with no actual physical release of Barbarian. So who knew when we were going to actually get an unrated version of Megan? Uh, so this, I think for me, kind of came a little quicker than I expected. I thought this was going to be, you know, a little bit down the road for it. But uh, I'm definitely intrigued here um, just because... You know, this is a film that you want to see the a lot of gore in, in, in those really killer uh, kill sequences, you know. So it's kind of like um, kind of finally getting this to be able to actually view this um, in its entirety and kind of what that original screenplay um, had played out. I'm really psyched to see this one. 
Yeah, um, I'm I'm also excited to see it. Uh, I'm even more excited because I actually overlooked it in the article and I didn't see this uh, tweet here uh, that you had mentioned before we started that it's going to be on Peacock on the 24th. So I get to watch it uh, before I make the decision on whether or not I'm going to purchase it, uh, which I'll probably wait for a voodoo sale or something later on down the road. Uh, I think it's good fun. I do want my wife to check it out. But uh, yeah, the only thing about this and the reason, because I know we kind of debated about whether we should talk about this or not, um, that I wanted to bring up here was, do you think that this sets a dangerous precedent for, uh, you know, horror films going forward? Do you think that, you know, them seeing the success of, okay, we had an R-rated film, uh, it went viral, we cut it down uh, to PG-13 to get more uh, people in the door. And, you know, we're just going to have to have them pay for it again and release it again, um, the unrated version on Blu-ray. It, it just, to me, it, it feels a little bit like a way around for them to just double dip on the audience, which, I mean, if you're a horror fan, most of us are going to rewatch these films again and again anyway. But at the same time, it's kind of like, uh, there's the the filmmaker in me that's kind of sitting there like, God, I'd hate to live in a world where I make this movie with a certain intent and the studio is just like, oh, well, we're going to Megan this. So we're going to cut it down to PG-13 uh, just to sell more tickets. It just it just seems like we're going down a shaky path. Um, For me, I, I think that narrative could always be out there almost with anything in the horror genre. And I don't think it's really necessarily anything new with uh the release of megan either where it's like looking at at something like halloween that was never kind of watered down in, in order to kind of get the the massive audience they they you know they did the they did the r and it still garnered the type of audience it's like uh some of these things i mean maybe you could see that but it's something like you know uh 2022 uh how how often is barbarian talked about now and, and you know they didn't water that one down for um a pg-13 rating so i think maybe that there are some maybe uh, a, a handful of concepts out there where you could see this happen but i don't think this is something that's going to endanger the entire horror genre to say uh a lot of uh you know 70 percent of horror films are now going to be pg-13 and, and then we'll eventually release an unrated cut i think um especially with the creatives in the horror space i think they're gonna kind of really want to stick to their guns to say no we need that hard R and we can't really compromise with this. I do think maybe there'll be a handful of films that um, could go that route with it. But, you know, I think Megan into its own was almost such a, a, a unique film, especially, you know, with her dancing and things like that, where that really became that meme where it's like, I don't think a lot of horror films have that marketability where it's like, you know, I think they kind of um, a younger audience may have latched on to that certain scene. And then it kind of, steamrolled from there where i don't think there's going to be a lot of different horror films that are going to have scenes like that where a younger audience is going to latch on and be like okay we all have to go to the theater to see this film yeah and i mean it is just kind of a i look at these things in trends like you know it's like i can't help but kind of follow box office numbers and things like that and even in the article it reports about how big of a hit this was like I stopped paying attention to Megan after a little while and I didn't even realize this almost was a $200 million film. Like this, um, this made $167 million at the box office. And they said 91 million of that was in the United States alone, which is insane for a uh, January uh, beginning of the year horror flick, which is usually throwaway. And I mean, there are merits. The film was fun. It was good. It was definitely something that I enjoyed watching. Um, but again, in a society where we kind of vote for with our wallets and the studios pay attention to that, I'm a little concerned that, um, you know, they're, we're, they're probably going to have reports that uh, Megan's going to do really, really well on streaming. And then eventually when it comes to uh, Blu-ray, I'm sure it's going to do really well, just like they talked about how Terrifier 2 did really well. Um and I'm just a little bit worried that it's going to send the wrong message there because like, and I'm not so worried about like indie filmmakers and things like that. When it comes to people like uh, Kyle Edward ball or Robbie Banfitch and stuff like their films are going to come out uh, how they're going to come out. But like, 
I'm worried about like our Blum houses and things like that and how they, they're the ones putting this out and they're going to say, you know, this worked for Megan. I think we can do this with uh, just about every unproven property. Cause like you bring up Halloween, it's a proven property. I feel like they would have more backlash for that being PG 13. Um, but with unproven properties, it's like we could have been looking at a completely different film here and yeah. We're going to have to wait and see because like it could be one of those things where the unrated version is 40 seconds of extra footage and it's just a little bit more blood and it's literally nothing. Uh, or we could be looking at something where it's like, yeah, we have five minutes here of actual like attack and gore. And it's like, OK, that's quite significant. So we'll have to see. Yeah. And just a, one other thing where it's like um, Halloween is a proven property and then kind of like, you know, diving into barbarian unique. It was new. Um, same thing with Black Phone, where it's like some of these things, they have to be rated R. Where Yeah, Black Phone was one, Blumhouse also. So, yeah. And this one here, I feel like, like, again, probably unique into its own, where we're dealing with a killer doll. And I think that already kind of sends a message to maybe a younger audience that says, you know, oh, this is going to be a funnier film. Um, so I think, again, Megan was probably such a, such a different animal, where it's like, okay, I... You know, I think it would surprise me more if this was release rated R as opposed to PG-13. I mean, being horror fans, we always want everything rated R. But like this one here, I can see this one marketed to an even younger audience to just kind of be like, oh, look, it's a killer doll. This is fun. Uh, come to the theater and check it out. I mean, I think for me, it's like I, I feel like marketing knew what they were doing when they put in her dancing. You know what I mean? So it's like I feel like that was not a mistake. I feel like it was like touch and go let's feel this out and if it becomes a big thing let's let's pivot and make this pg-13 but you know horror genre again that's the beauty of it um here you know i guess uh you know i'm getting my cake and eating it too i got to see megan in the theater and now i'm gonna go see it at home with the unrated cut this early on so for me i'm not gonna complain about it it's it's gonna be uh a unique experience again i'm excited to actually check this one out on peacock and uh you know just revisit it because i had so much fun in the theater with it yeah and you did bring up a good point that uh if you guys want definitely comment below if you guys would like us to maybe do like a follow-up review or like a small video uh talking about the unrated cut i mean that's definitely could be open to discussion depending on how much content is there uh maybe we'll if there's not a lot maybe we'll just revisit it on the sunday scaries here but uh, if it seems like it's a good bit and you guys want us to uh, cover it, please comment down below. Let us know. All righty. But, uh, yeah, I guess we can move on to our next story here. Uh, you can check out the article on Bloody Disgusting. They do detail um, a couple of special features. I'll just title them as uh, a new vision of horror. Uh, they break down kind of their vision for Megan, uh, bringing Megan to life, going behind the animatronics and the puppet. And then uh, getting hacked, just another behind-the-scenes look. So there is going to be some special features. Uh, no word of a commentary, though, which, you know, gotta gotta pick it up on that, guys. We want more commentaries. So Let's get moving. All righty, and speaking of let's get moving, let's get on to the next story with Sting. First look at arachnophobia horror movie featuring practical spider effects from Weta. Um, so I think that, you know, bloody disgusting you do a great job we use you every week for our news but uh i, I feel like when i first read this because i read this before you sent it to me uh i was like oh arachnophobia because we know it's getting a remake i was like oh yeah. did we is this uh an image from that is that coming on so quickly no this is a different film uh which is cool but i i totally get it like it's going to get those people to click on it just because it's like oh arachnophobia um you know or maybe that's just me because Jeff I, I daniels love that movie. Yeah, dude, I fucking love Arachnophobia. We'll have to cover it on the podcast Absolutely. soon. That Absolutely. That movie is movie. awesome. John Goodman, love ah. his character in that, dude. Um, anyway, yeah, this seems pretty interesting. So we kind of dove into the article a little bit. Um, they just wrapped uh, in Sydney, Australia, where this is being filmed. Uh, it is uh, Kina Roche Turner's. I don't know how to say her name. I'm so sorry if you're watching this. You're probably not, but hey. Uh, but the film stars uh, Ryan Core from House of the Dragon and the Water Diviner, uh, Alia Brown, uh, Th uh, Thousand Year Longing, Perfect Nine Perfect Strangers, Penelope Mitchell, uh, Roy Nevelin, and uh, Nani Hazelhurst, and uh, Jermaine Flower. Uh, and basically, like the just to sum up what it is, 
uh, essentially they live in New York. Uh, there's this mysterious object that falls from the sky, turns out to be a little tiny spider. And this little girl who's feeling a little bit alienated from her family because, uh, you know, her mom just married a guy and they're having a baby. So they're taking care of the baby. Uh, she ends up taking this little spider in and raising it. And the spider just keeps getting bigger and bigger and eating pets in the apartment and then eating uh, neighbors and all these horrible things. And it just seems to increase um, until finally she has to be the one to put it down um, is the gist of it. And uh, yeah, it sounds pretty fun. Not going to lie. Um, I think the big grabbing part of this headline is that it is going to be mostly practical effects, which is yeah. neat. So, Luke, how you um, feeling about Sting? You know, initially reading the title article, I was like, nah, Spider movie. You know, it's like we already have uh, the original Arachnophobia and then a remake coming out. I was like, do, do I even need this? And then uh, getting into, you know, the meat of that synopsis where it's like, uh, you know, this object from space, you know, falls down and it turns out to be like an egg or whatever. And mm -hmm. the, the spider shows up. I for me, I absolutely love this concept. I think, <laughs> you know, it. it screams great fun i think here um where it's like i i think we need these unique properties i mean we just talked about it briefly where it's like you know the horror genre is, is so versatile with winnie the pooh and megan and all these things i think this one can be a lot of fun it's got a lot of potential to just be like that that really fun watch especially if this ends up on shutter or anything like that where it's like man you just flip it on it's a killer spider i mean we you know Eight legged freaks is is something we both uh, hold in our heart. So it's like love eight legged freaks. That's another one I'd love to talk about long form. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, and it's like something again. You know what you're in for, and just adding in the practical effects uh, factor here is going to make me even more intrigued for this film because it's like already a fun concept. Um, one of those things where you know we've talked about on the podcast where CGI tends to get dated really quick. Where it's like this one, I can see. If it, the practical effects are great and or even just good, you know, I can watch this one for years to come and, you know, and just get lost in it. So I'm really intrigued to see where they go here. Um, I think it has a lot of potential, especially when we're dealing with a space spider. It's like you can really add in a lot of elements here, not just necessarily the spider, you know, biting and eating people. I would love to see them the spider bite people and be if them affected, you know, uh, because it is a space spider. You can pretty much oh, do imagine if they bit him and like they just start melting like acid yeah. and stuff like that like that'd be so cool it'll be like um you know leprechaun four in space with the uh the doctor who got you know intertwined with the spider dna oh it's yeah like, let's start doing all or this gremlins stuff, you know? so I'm a... gremlins See, too i i would love for the, you know just saying that this is a space spider really opens up all this potential here so it's like that's where my brain started going here so i am fully on board with this thing i really want to see where they go with it I agree. I think this sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, definitely great to see practical effects coming back. Uh, definitely cool to see something from down under as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, Australia, they've got a history with some pretty uh, badass horror films. I'm, I can think of uh, who's the director. I, I forget his name. He did Rogue and Wolf Creek, you know, all great uh, Australian I can't set horror films. Yeah. And I know this is set in New York, but, uh, you know, the filmmakers are Australian. But then I even got to think about like Razorback and stuff like that which is an 80s film but god that movie's amazing so i haven't seen know. it i know you talk highly of it so oh again. we'll cover we'll cover it maybe this summer because the uh screen factory is releasing the blu-ray so yeah it's it's on my list of potential uh picks for the next upcoming months maybe august or so um but yeah that uh i think this all sounds great i'm definitely excited for this uh you know spiders uh, they aren't my ride or die like like werewolves and sharks and alligators yeah. are, but like you know, I I would love to see a good spider movie. Yeah, they're yeah. very few and far between. Yes. I say because there are so many of those shitty uh, sci-fi spider movies, uh, and they ice don't even spiders. get my ice spiders. Yes, that's actually one I have seen. I think that one has um, Edward Furlong in it. Um, oh man! But uh, yeah, no, I've seen that. I've seen all kinds of stuff and they just never hit they always look too hokey but yeah it's it's about time we get a good spider film so i hope uh we get to see this uh in maybe even a theater nearby uh or if it just goes to streaming that's fine too but yeah i'm i'm here for sting so we'll check it out yes it should be pretty interesting but uh, that moves on to our next story here with another film coming out uh from new line 
Uh, and this is actually one that uh, Zach Krieger has attached himself to as well. Uh, not in a directing capacity. Uh, he is producing this, but it is called The Occupant, which uh, is pretty cool. I mean, this is uh, kind of an interesting story. Um, it's a haunted house film, but it was sold off of a short story uh, that somebody wrote. And, you know, it's something where it's like they had like a, a mass bidding war over this, which is kind of funny because like... Um, you know, uh, Zach Krieger was in the news a couple weeks ago for having a bidding war over weapons, which is something that he will be uh, behind directly. So it's one of those things where it's like he's just really hot property right now. I mean, makes perfect sense. Uh, Barbarian, obviously our favorite film of last year as far as horror goes. And uh, yeah, he really came out on the scene here. So any he's, he's kind of like that Jordan Peele effect, I think. Yeah. So it's like anything you put his name on, people are going to get interested in. But this is super interesting. Like, this feels uh, very grimy, very uh, uh, Stephen King-like. Um, and it's kind of wild to me. Again, this is based off a, a short story. It's 39 pages long. And they have already developed, like, we're going to be making this. Um, and I believe this is, uh, I, if I said movie, I apologize. I believe this is a series uh, that they're trying to bring to light. I, I was listening to the uh, Bloody Disgusting podcast earlier today and they talked about it for a few minutes so but luke how you feeling about the occupant uh reading that article it hit me pretty intrigued i mean like you know it, you hear this bidding war and like how you mentioned zach creaker was uh, we we covered it a few weeks ago with weapons it's like horror is back in such a big way you know it's like um i think studios are really out here searching for these unique properties and for this to be a short story and kind of you know hanging their head on that and being like, okay, but let's, let's pivot and, and make this into a TV series. I think uh, that gives, a, you know, a lot of budding horror writers uh, a lot of hope to be like, oh, well, you know, a, a lot of properties, even if they're not in screenplay format can really be turned into uh, something for film or TV, you know, and, and find that medium there. So for me, this got me really excited. I, I think the concept here uh, seems like a lot of fun. It's, you know, one of those things where um, at first glance, you might think, well, it, it, you know, it's been done to death, but I think they're kind of putting a different spin on it a little bit. So um, I'm definitely intrigued to see where this is going to go. Um, they didn't say like how many episodes. Are, I mean, this is in its infancy, I think. So I think I don't so. Really think they had a little bit more information on the podcast that I don't see detailed in the article here, but they said that um, basically they have one season uh, in mind, but they, uh, are primed and ready to go for another so at least two seasons but the one season is what they're uh selling right now so it's been purchased at one so if it does well we'll get a second season essentially it, you know and and that's where it's like mm, you know if especially if they're covering that short story in that first season and they're going to kind of go their own route in the second season you never really know how that goes um so, I mean, that would have me a little hesitant, but I, you know, I think we're in for a really good, at least first season there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that really stands out to me is like when they describe the film, um, you know, not to get into details about it, just because I don't want to take up any more time here. But uh, it, it does sound very interesting that the little tag that they put here that I, I caught my attention is uh, it is one part poltergeist mixed with Stephen King. Yeah. So it's kind of like those are, are two very um classic iconic uh names there when it comes to horror cinema or horror literature so it's kind of one of those things where it's like the melding of that is is definitely fantastic in my mind if they can get the vibes right and they can kind of pull that off I, i'd be very interested to see this and yeah again um you know it's producing but uh anything that zach krieger seems to attach his name to right now uh, Hollywood is just trying to snap up as best they can. So it must feel good to be him at this moment in time. I mean, he just says he wants to produce this and it was literally a, a bidding war in the trenches. They say between uh, Paramount Lionsgate and Amazon with new line, uh, that won, which they picked up weapons too. Didn't they? I thought new line picked up weapons. So I'm going to have to double check on that there. Because uh, I think if they picked up weapons, then someone at New Line is uh, definitely uh, got Zach Krieger in his back pocket. Yeah, I noticed that too. And it's like, you know, I, I think, again, I think a lot of these studios are seeing how bankable 
the horror genre is and you know it's almost entering this renaissance i think uh of you know almost like 80 slasher and stuff like that but it's more so i, I don't know i think there's maybe a li little even more a little more like gravitas to it right now with the uniqueness of the stories and i think studios are figuring that out so they're like we got to jump on this right now and i think new line's really trying to make a play to have a lot of these unique properties being brought to that studio as well. So I, I you know, I think it's an intriguing time again for horror. I think we're going to see a lot of this stuff out here. And I mean, Zach Krieger uh, right now can do no wrong. So I think anytime he's going to be attached to anything, there's probably going to be, you're going to see that, that term bidding war in, in a lot of these uh, different articles with him. Oh yeah. I would agree on that. Um, yeah, you know what New Line needs to do, though, if they really want to get back into the horror game, if they're really trying here, I, I'm, I'm all for picking up the original properties, especially from talents like this. Uh, but uh, get Nightmare on Elm Street back on the big stream. Like, we're, we we need that. Uh, I need that series revived. Like, let's let's get back to it. Everybody else is doing it. We got Ghostface. We got, you know, Jason coming back now, which we never thought was going to happen. Like, where's Freddy Krueger? You know what I'm saying? Well, you know, Robert England. Um, I, I think that I think, well, you know, I think that's kind of the, the, uh, the obstacle there where it's like, you know, he's not going to be around forever. So, well, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But all right, we'll move on to our next story here where we're, uh, we're talking about M night Shyamalan. Yes. So, uh, we just talked about knock at the cabin not too long ago. Uh, you know, we both enjoyed that film quite a bit. Thought that was really interesting and fun. Uh, again, definitely a little bit unique for him. Um, you know, we're pretty much talking his new film here, which is set to be Trap, uh, which is already set to come out August uh, 2nd of 2024. Again, kind of leading into this, I was saying it to you before we recorded here that uh, he seems to be pretty consistent with having like one film a year. We had uh, Old last year. Um, now we have this. And then, of course, we're going to have, uh, you know, Trap again next year so lots of fun great to see him back on the ball but i think the thing that really interests me about this is that uh you know m knight has uh, signed a multi-year first look de directing and producing deal with warner brothers so he's kind of been taken into the house of warner brothers uh you know with their whole shake up and everything going on with them uh it's kind of i think an interesting play that they snapped up uh m knight you know because most of the time, and I mean, first look basically says that they get first dibs, so they could always pass on it and somebody else could produce it. But, you know, 90% of the time, if they got a first look deal, they're going to make the movie. So they must really like what they've been seeing from him. And I mean, obviously, he's an established name. Uh, his movies are still making money. So, you know, I think the years of uh, M. Night being considered box office poison are kind of behind him. Yeah, I, I still think for better or worse, you know, you hear M. Night Shyamalan I think blatant curiosity is probably uh, the best term uh, to kind of put next to his name of what you're, what, what is this film going to look like? And I mean, like, mm -hmm. I think that was a big play for old, whether you liked it or did not. I think that was kind of like, what is this film uh, going into it? Um, and even knock at the cabin, I think still had that um, kind of curiosity of what is this going to look like? And, Again, we reviewed it and waiting for a twist or what was that twist going to be, you know? So it, I think M. Night is, is one of those uh, few directors that are out there that um, has an expectation next to his name, uh, again, for better or worse. But you're expecting something going into those films no matter what before you even hear uh, the synopsis of what it's going to be. So, you know, I think Warner Brothers knows that um, and they know he's one of those few directors that still, you know, um, it can can just sell a movie by his name alone um so you know it doesn't surprise me that they they picked them up because it's like having him in your camp and being able to you know having the luxury of seeing the movie or you know being able to say i want to do this film or we're going to pass on it i mean it's the best of both worlds you know you get first dibs on it or you don't even have to deal with it so you know i and that's probably how a lot of m night Shyamalan stuff goes where it's like you know this is great and you know not today, M. Night. So um, I'm intrigued to see what he's going to come up with next. I mean, Trap, um, I, I don't think there's really anything out there on this film uh, other Not than much. the name. No, this um, was just reported on a couple hours ago. So, But, you know, we were both pretty pleased with Knock at the Cabin. So yeah. 
I hope he stays on that path and, and continues that trajectory, at least uh, for the next few films that he does. Because, uh, I mean, let's cast Dave Bautista again. Let's do it. I think that they could have a good working relationship. A lot of people uh, really leaned on to his performance from Knock at the Cabin, saying that it's one of the strongest performances he's ever given. Um, I would say so. I think uh, an easy follow-up to that is his performance in Blade Runner 2049. Although brief. Uh, very impactful and effective. Um, and yeah, you know, I I definitely like this. It sounds good. It's definitely a nice little upgrade for M. Night. You know, he'll get bigger budgets and things, uh, you know, working with Warner Brothers just kind of, you know, naturally. Um, but, you know, I, I want him to kind of stay, um, you know, really in his, his wheelhouse. You know, he's been doing really well with these uh, lower budget thrillers. And kind of just, you know, adapting material, uh, really, I think, kind of uh, stepping away from trying to make this an M. Night Shyamalan film and, yeah. and make this just a good film. And, you know, I think that that's kind of what the issue was, uh, you know, looking at some of his work from the mid 2000s. I think everything after The Village, you know, for a while there was pretty uh, shaky. So it's one of those things where it's like now that he can kind of just get back to that, I hope he stays there. I, I don't want him to, you know, kind of get that. And not to say that he had a big head, but I don't want him to get too caught up in the, I need to be known as the twist guy. Uh, I need to be, you know, making these big, like crazy films. I mean, Knock at the Cabin is a very simple story. Yeah. And, you know, he really mastered it with beautiful cinematography, beautiful camera work, and just bang on performances. And that's really like why I think this movie is one of his best in years. So it's kind of one of those things where I'm just like, stay with it, stay the course. Cause you're really getting there again. Old didn't work for me so much, but I liked old a lot more than I could say. I liked the happening or lady in the water or after earth or avatar, you know, there's, there's so many other movies that I would put under old, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's definitely he just needs to kind of, stay the course i mean he can do different genres if he wants to like i'm not saying don't do that but i'm just saying don't uh don't fall into those old expectations yeah uh you know i i also think he's got to stick to the basics there i mean you talk about dave batista's performance and knock at the cab and uh, james mcavoy in splits in glass yeah. i mean like bringing out these performances um you know i think glass gets a little muddled in terms of the story telling maybe even split to an extent you know where you know he, i think he could try to go a little overboard but it's like he still had these great performances from uh, a lot of these actors and i think m night can really bring out those performances as we've seen in in his films it just kind of gets muddled in in being the twist guy so it's like mm -hmm. kind of just sticking to the bare basics um building some tension bringing out these great performances and really sticking in that thriller kind of realm i think maybe with a little horror injected in there i think can work well for him so i'm hoping he stays you know on this path um i mean i'm so positive on knock at the cabin i do want to see that film again and that's not something i say often with m night Shyamalan films usually i'm a one and done kind of guy with it uh but you know i'm intrigued to check uh check out uh knock at the cabin again so um, you know, I hope I can, I can keep this relationship that I have right now with M. Night Shyamalan. Does it get too volatile again? So, um, yeah. we'll see hey, what happens. Yeah. Only time will tell, you know, it's, it's like you said with M. Night, it's kind of like every other movie or so, but, uh, yeah, I think again, just stay the path, you know, keep doing what you're doing. You're definitely, you're in the pocket now. It's just about staying in there. So, but alrighty, guys, that's going to wrap us up here for the news on the Sunday Scaries here. So that's about everything we got for you. Uh, you know, interesting week, lots of fun stories. Uh, definitely, again, interested to see how Megan Unrated is going to turn out. Uh, Sting seems like a lot of fun. Uh, you know, Zach Krieger, I mean, that's a name right now, man. They're getting in there. And yeah, again, M. Night, I mean, we'll be there for Trap uh, August 2nd. So we will be reporting on it. Uh, and, you know... I uh, I definitely think we got a good couple of weeks coming uh, with with everything happening. I mean, we got 65. We got Scream. They're right around the corner. Uh, Cocaine Bear, I think, is next week, if I'm not wrong. Is it? Man, that snuck up on us. Yeah, Cocaine Bear is coming. Uh, so, okay, no, no, no. Uh, as of, yeah, Cocaine Bear. Wait, is it? 
When is that release? I thought that was the 28th. I am not sure of the date, to be honest. I don't know. But uh, anyway, we're going to be talking about a, a bear on cocaine at some point here. Uh, and, in the next few weeks. Yeah, so get ready for that. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm excited for it. Yeah, the 24th. So, yeah, next week we have Cocaine Bear on Friday. So, you know, we'll definitely have that coming to you guys. I'm excited to see that one. And, uh, yeah, we have a lot of cool content coming to the channel. Lots of fun stuff we have planned, of course. You know, we're doing our best to circle up some more great interviews. Uh, if you guys haven't checked out the ones we have up, we have, uh, you know, we just spoke with the uh, director and producer of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, the most controversial film in Hollywood at the moment. Uh, you know, we had a great, con uh, you know, talk with them. And then uh, a movie that just hit Screenbox on Friday, uh, The Outwaters. We spoke with director Robbie Banfitch. So definitely check those interviews out and, uh, you know, get deep into the mind of these filmmakers. Uh, they're good conversations. We definitely enjoyed doing them. Yeah, um, big variety in terms of uh, the horror genre right now. And we thought maybe uh, starting off uh, 2023, we'd get a little uh, little break in, in, you know, before it, we started gearing up here. But it looks like uh, that was, if we had one, it was very short-lived. I mean, we kicked it off with Megan, and it's just kept going uh, since then. So and, and the next few months are going to be even busier. So yeah. Um, our, our little break is to be determined there. Uh, but, you know, it's a good problem to have, I would say. Hey, absolutely. Good problems, bad problems. I love these problems. So, alrighty, guys, that's going to wrap us up here. So, until next time, uh, I'm Dylan Noll. And I'm Luke Janesco. And remember, stay scared.